the battlefield at night by george sterling read for LibriVox.org by bruce Kachuk. when on war's wounded falls the final sleep how beautiful shall silence be to those on whom till then the sounds of carnage close and trampling billows of the conflict sweep a camp unsentineled that host shall keep nor countersign reveal its friends and foes and in that zone of death shall be repose more kind than love and than the dark more deep but now unceasing thunders tread the night mid flamings and cessations of the light and the faint sense delays ere death to hark the bellowing of guns against the sky and as the decimating cannon cry the mangled horses screaming in the dark End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Coldness and Love by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. And you remember, in the afternoon, the sea and the sky went grey, as if there had sunk a flocculent dust on the floor of the world. The festoon of the sky sagged dusty as spider cloth and coldness clogged the sea till it ceased to croon a dank sickening scent came up from the grime of weed that blackened the shore so that i recoiled feeling the raw cold dun me and all the time you leapt about on the slippery rocks and threw the words that rang with a brassy shallow chime and all day long that raw and ancient cold deadened me through till the grey downs darkened to sleep. Then I longed for you with your mantle of love to fold me over, and drive from out of my body the deep cold that had sunk to my soul, and there kept hold. But still to me all evening long you were cold, and I was numb with a bitter, deathly ache, till old days drew me back into their fold, and dim sheep crowded me warm with companionship, and old ghosts clustered me close, and sleep was cajoled. I slept till dawn at the window blew in like dust, like the linty raw cold dust disturbed from the floor of a disused room, a grey pale light like must that settled upon my face and hands till it seemed to flourish there, as pale mould blooms on a crust. Then I rose in fear, needing you fearfully, for I thought you were warm as the sudden jet of blood, I thought I could plunge in your spurting hotness, and be clean of the cold and the must. With my hand on the latch I heard you in your sleep speak strangely to me. And I dare not enter, feeling suddenly dismayed. So I went and washed my deadened flesh in the sea, and came back tingling clean, but worn and frayed with cold, like the shell of the moon. And strange it seems that my love has dawned and rose again, like the love of a maid. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Crooked Man by Anonymous Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Crooked Man There was a crooked man, and he went a crooked mile, And he found a crooked sixpence against a crooked stile. He bought a crooked hat, which caught a crooked mouse, and they all live together in a little crooked house. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Dolores by Emma Lazarus. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Dolores. A light at her feet and a light at her head. How fast asleep my Dolores lies. Awaken, my love, for tomorrow we wed. Uplift the lids of thy beautiful eyes. Too soon art thou clad in white, my spouse. Who placed that garland above thy heart, which shall wreathe tomorrow thy bridal brows? 
how quiet and mute and strange thou art and hearest thou not my voice that speaks and feelest thou not my hot tears flow as i kiss thine eyes and thy lips and thy cheeks do they not warm thee my bride of snow thou knowest no grief though thy love may weep a phantom smile with a faint wan beam is fixed on thy features sealed in sleep o oh, tell me the secret bliss of thy dream does it lead to fair meadows with flowering trees where thy sister angels hail thee their own was not my love to thee dearer than these thine was my world and my heaven in one i dare not call thee aloud nor cry thou art so solemn so wrapped in rest but i will whisper dolores tis i my heart is breaking within my breast never ere now did i speak thy name itself a caress but the love light leapt into thine eyes with a kindling flame and a ripple of rose over thy soft cheek crept but now wilt thou stir not for passion or prayer and makest no sign of the lips or the eyes with a nun's straight band over thy bright black hair blind to mine anguish and deaf to my cries i stand no more in the waxen lit room i see thee again as i saw thee that day in a world of sunshine and springtide bloom midst the green and white of the budding may now shadow now shine as the branches ope flickereth over my love the while from her sunny eyes gleams the maytime hope and her pure lips dawn in a wistful smile as one who waiteth i see her stand who waits though she knows not what nor whom with a lilac spray in her slim soft hand all the air is sweet with its spicy bloom i knew not her secret though she held mine in that golden hour did we each confess and her low voice murmured yea i am thine and the large world rang with my happiness to-morrow shall be the blessedest day that ever the all-seeing sun espied though thou sleep till the morning's earliest ray yet then thou must waken to be my bride yea waken my love for to-morrow we wed uplift the lids of thy beautiful eyes a light at her feet and a light at her head how fast asleep my dolores lies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp The sea is calm tonight, the tide is full, the moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window sweet is the night air only from the long line of spray where the sea meets the moon blanched land listen you hear the grating roar of pebbles which the waves draw back and fling at their return up the high strand begin and cease and then again begin with tremulous cadence slow and bring the eternal note of sadness in sophocles long ago heard it on the aegean and had brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in this sound a thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea. The sea of faith was once too at the full, and round earth's shore lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy long withdrawing roar retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world ah love let us be true to one another for the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams so various so beautiful so new hath really neither joy nor love nor light nor certitude nor peace nor help for pain and we are here as on a darkling plain, 
swept with confused alarms of struggle and flight, where ignorant armies clash by night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Down by the Sally Gardens by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. Down by the Sally Gardens, my love and I did meet. She passed the Sally Gardens with little snow white feet. She bid me take love easy as the leaves grow on the tree. But I, being young and foolish, with her would not agree. In a field by the river, my love and I did stand, and on my leaning shoulder she laid her snow-white hand. She bid me take life easy as the grass grows on the weirs, but I was young and foolish, and now am full of tears. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Fidelity by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tomlinson London, 2017 A barking sound the shepherd hears, A cry as of a dog or fox. He halts and searches with his eyes Among the scattered rocks and now at distance can discern a stirring in a brake of fern, from which immediately leaps out a dog, and yelping runs about. The dog is not of mountain breed, its motions, too, are wild and shy, with something, as the shepherd thinks, unusual in its cry. Nor is there any one in sight all round, in hollow or on height, nor shout nor whistle strikes his ear, what is the creature doing here? It was a cove, a huge recess that keeps till June December's snow. A lofty precipice in front, a silent tarn below. Far in the bosom of Helvellyn, remote from public road or dwelling, pathway or cultivated land, from trace of human foot or hand. There sometimes does a leaping fish send through the tarn a lonely cheer. The crags repeat the raven's croak in symphony or steer. Thither the rainbow comes, the cloud, and mist that spread the flying shroud. And sunbeams and the sounding blast that, if it could, would hurry past, but that enormous barrier binds it fast. Not knowing what to think, a while the shepherd stood, then makes his way towards the dog, o'er rocks and stones as quickly as he may. Nor far had gone before he found a human skeleton on the ground. Sad sight, the shepherd with a sigh looks round to learn the history. From those abrupt and perilous rocks the man had fallen, that place of fear. At length upon the shepherd's mind it breaks, and all is clear. He instantly recalled the name, and who he was, and whence he came. Remembered, too, the very day on which the traveller passed this way. But here a wonder now, for sake, of which this mournful tale I tell. A lasting monument of words this wonder merits well. The dog which still was hovering nigh, repeating the same timid cry, this dog had been through three months' space, a dweller in that savage place. Yes, proof was plain that since the day on which the traveller thus had died, the dog had watched about the spot or by his master's side. How nourished here through such long time, he knows, who gave that love sublime, and gave that strength of feeling, great above all human estimate. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Frost at Midnight by Samuel Taylor Coleridge 
Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tomlinson London, January 2017 The frost performs its secret ministry, unhelped by an wind. The owlet's cry came loud, and hark again, loud as before. The inmates of my cottage, all at rest, have left me to that solitude which suits abstruser musings, save that at my side my cradle infant slumbers peacefully. Tis calm indeed, so calm that it disturbs and vexes meditation with its strange and extreme silentness. See, hill and wood, this populous village. See, hill and wood, with all the numberless goings-on of life. Inaudible as dreams, the thin blue flame lies on my low-burnt fire and quivers not. Only that film which fluttered on the grate still flutters there, the sole unquiet thing. Bethinks its motion in this hush of nature gives it dim sympathies with me who live, making it a companionable form whose puny flaps and freaks the idling spirit by its own moods interprets everywhere echo or mirror seeking of itself and makes a toy of thought but oh how oft how oft at school with most believing mind presageful have i gazed upon the bars to watch that fluttering stranger and as oft with unclosed lids Already had I dreamt of my sweet birthplace and the old church tower, whose bells, the poor man's only music, rang from morn to evening all the hot fair day, so sweetly that they stirred and haunted me with a wild pleasure, falling on mine ear most like articulate sounds of things to come. So gazed I, till the soothing things I dreamt lulled me to sleep, and sleep prolonged my dreams. And so I brooded all the following morn, awed by the stern preceptor's face, mine eye fixed with mick study on my swimming book, save if the door half opened, and I snatched a hasty glance, and still my heart leaped up, for still I hoped to see the stranger's face, townsman, or aunt, or sister more beloved, my playmate when we both were clothed alike. Dear babe, that sleep is cradled by my side, whose gentle breathings heard in this deep calm fill up the indispersed vacancies and momentary pauses of the thought. My babe so beautiful, it thrills my heart with tender gladness, thus to look at thee, and think that thou shalt learn far other lore, and in far other scenes. For I was reared in the great city, pent mid cloisters dim, and saw naught lovely but the sky and stars. But thou, my babe, shall wander like a breeze by lakes and sandy shores, beneath the clouds which image in their bulk both lakes and shores and mountain crags. So shalt thou see and hear the lovely shapes and sounds intelligible of that eternal language which thy God utters, who from eternity doth teach himself in all and all things in himself. Great universal teacher, he shall mould thy spirit and by giving make it ask. Therefore all seasons shall be sweet to thee, whether summer clothe the general earth with greenness, or the red breast sit and sing betwixt the tufts of snow on the bare branch of mossy apple tree, while the nigh thatch smokes in the sun thaw, whether the eve drops fall, heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining, to the quiet moon. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Glance Behind the Curtain by James Russell Lowell. Read for LibriVox by Josh Middledorf. A Glance Behind the Curtain. We see but half the causes of our deeds, seeking them wholly in the outer life 
and heedless of the encircling spirit world which though unseen is felt and sows in us all germs of pure and world-wide purposes from one stage of our being to the next we pass unconscious or a slender bridge the momentary work of unseen hands which crumbles down behind us looking back we see the other shore the gulf between and marvelling how we won to where we stand content ourselves to call the builder chance we trace the wisdom to the apples fall not to the birth throes of a mighty truth which for long ages in blank chaos dumb yet yearned to be incarnate and had found at last a spirit meet to be the womb for which it might be born to bless mankind not to the soul of newton ripe with all the hoarded thoughtfulness of earnest years and waiting but one ray of sunlight more to blossom fully but whence came that ray we call our sorrows destiny but ought rather to name our high successes so only the instincts of great souls are fate and have predestined sway all other things except by leave of us could never be for destiny is but the breath of god still moving in us the last fragment left of our unfallen nature waking oft within our thought to beckon us beyond the narrow circle of the seen and the known and always tending toward a noble end as all things must that overrule the soul and for a space unseat the helmsman will the fate of england and of freedom once seemed wavering in the heart of one plain man one step of his and the great dial hand that marks the destined progress of the world in the eternal round from wisdom on to higher wisdom had been made to pause a hundred years that step he did not take he knew not why nor we but only god and lived to make his simple oaken chair more terrible and soberly august more full of majesty than any throne before or after of any british king upon the pier stood two stern-visaged men looking to where a little craft lay moored swayed by the lazy current of the thames which weltered by in muddy listlessness grave men they were and battlings of fierce thought had trampled out all softness from their brows and ploughed rough furrows there before their time for other crop than such as home-bred peace sows broadcast in the willing soil of youth care not of self but for the common weal had robbed their eyes of youth and left instead a look of patient power and iron will and something fiercer too that grave broad hint of the plain weapons girded at their sides the younger had an aspect of command not such as trickles down a slender stream in the shrunk channel of a great descent but such as lies and towered in heart and head and an arm prompt to do the hests of both his was a brow where gold were out of place and yet it seemed right worthy of a crown though he despised such were it only made of iron or some serviceable stuff that would have matched his brownly rugged face the elder although such he had hardly seemed care makes a little of some five short years had a clear honest face whose rough-hewn strength was mildened by the scholar's wiser heart to sober courage such as best befits the unsullied temper of a well-taught mind yet so remains that one could plainly guess the hushed volcano smouldering underneath he spoke the other hearing kept his gaze still fixed as on some problem in the sky o oh, cromwell we are fallen on evil times there was a day when england had a wide room for honest men as well as foolish kings but now the uneasy stomach of the time turns squeamish at them both therefore let us seek out that savage clime where men as yet are free there sleeps the vessel on the tide 
her languid canvas drooping for the wind give us but that and what needs we to fear this order of the council the free waves will not say no to please a wayward king nor will the winds turn traitors at his beck all things are fitly cared for and the lord will watch us kindly o'er the exodus of his servants now as in old time we have no cloud or fire and haply we may not pass dry shod through the ocean stream but saved or lost all things are in his hand so spake he and meantime the other stood with wide gray eyes still reading the blank air as if upon the sky's blue wall he saw some mystic sentence written by a hand such as of old made pale the assyrian king girt with his satraps in the blazing feast hampton a moment since my purpose was to fly with thee for i will call it flight nor flatter it with any smoother name but something in me bids me not go and i am one thou knowest who unmoved by what the weak deem omens yet give heed and reverence due to whatsoever my soul whispers of warnings to the inner ear moreover as i know that god brings round his purposes in ways undreamed by us and makes the wicked but his instruments to hasten their own swift and sudden fall i see the beauty of his providence in the king's order blind he will not let his doom part from him but must bid it stay as twere a cricket whose enlivening chirp he loves to hear beneath his very hearth why should we fly nay why not rather stay and rear again our zion's crumpled walls not as of old the walls of thebes were built by minstrels twanging but if need should be with the more potent music of our swords thinkest thou that score of men beyond the sea claim more god's care than all of england here no when he moves his arm it is to aid whole peoples heedless if a few be crushed as some are ever when the destiny of man takes one stride onward nearer home believe me tis the mass of men he loves and where there is most sorrow and most want where the high heart of man is trodden down the most tis not because he hides his face from them in wrath as purblind teachers prate not so there most is he for there is he most needed men who seek for fate abroad are not so near his heart as they who dare frankly to face her where she faces them on their own threshold where their souls are strong to grapple with and throw her as i once being yet a boy did cast this puny king who now has grown so doddered as to deem that he can wrestle with an angry realm and throw the brawned antaeus of men's rights no hampton they have halfway conquered fate who go halfway to meet her as i will freedom hath yet a work for me to do so speaks that inward voice which never yet spake falsely when it urged the spirit on to noble emprise for country and mankind and for success i ask no more than this to bear unflinching witness to the truth all true whole men succeed for what is worth success's name unless it be the thought the inward surety to have carried out a noble purpose to a noble end although it be the gallows or the block tis only falsehood that doth ever need these outward shows of gain to bolster her be it we prove the weaker with our swords truth only needs to be for f once spoke out and there's such music in her such strained rhythm as makes men's memories her joyous slaves and clings around the soul as the sky clings round the mute earth forever beautiful and if o'er clouded only to burst forth more all-embracingly divine and clear get but the truth once uttered and tis like a star new-born that drops into its place and which once circling in its placid round not all the tumult of the earth can shake what should we do in that small colony of pinched fanatics who would rather choose freedom to clip an inch more from their hair than the great chance of setting england free not there amid the stormy wilderness should we learn wisdom or if learned what room to put it into act 
else worse than naught. We learn our souls more tossing for an hour upon this huge and ever-vexed sea of human thought, where kingdoms go to wreck like fragile bubbles yonder in the stream, than in a cycle of New England sloth, broke only by a petty Indian war or a quarrel for a letter more or less in some hard word which spelt in either way not their most learned clerks can understand. New times demand new measures and new men. The world advances and in time outgrows the laws that in our father's day were best, and doubtless after us some purer scheme will be shaped out by wiser men than we, made wiser by the steady growth of truth. We cannot hail utopia on by force, but better almost be at work in sin than in brute inaction browse and sleep. No man is born into the world whose work is not born with him. There is always work, and tools to work withal for those who will, and blessed are the horny hands of toil. The busy world stoves angrily aside the man who stands with arms akimbo set until occasion tells him what to do, and he who waits to have his task marked out shall die and leave his errand unfulfilled. Our time is one that calls for earnest deeds. Season and government, like two broad seas, yearn for each other with outstretched arms across this narrow isthmus of the throne, and roll their white surf higher every day. One age moves onward, and the next builds up cities and gorgeous palaces where stood the rude log huts of those who tamed the wild, rearing from out the forest that they had felled the goodly framework of a fairer state. The builder's trowel and the settler's axe are seldom wielded by the selfsame hand. Ours is the harder task, yet not the less shall we receive the blessing for our toil from the choice spirits of the aftertime. My soul is not a palace of the past, where outworn creeds like Rome's grey senate quake hearing af afar the vandal's trumpet hoarse that shakes old systems with a thunder fit. That time is ripe and rotten ripe for change. Then let it come. I have no dread of what is called for by the instinct of mankind, nor think I that God's world will fall apart because we tear a parchment more or less. Truth is eternal, but her effluence with endless change is fitted to the hour. Her mirror is turned forward to reflect the promise of the future, not the past. He who would win the name of truly great must understand his own age and the next and make the present ready to fulfill its prophecy and with the future merge gently and peacefully as wave with wave. The future works out great men's purposes. The present is enough for common souls who, never looking forward, are indeed mere clay wherein the footprints of their age are petrified forever. Better those who lead the blind old giant by the hand from out the pathless desert where he gropes and set him onward in his darksome way. I do not fear to follow truth, albeit along the precipice's edge. Let us speak plain. There is more force in names than most men dream of, and a lie may keep its throne a whole age longer if it sulk behind the shield of some fair-seeming name. Let us call tyrants tyrants and maintain that only freedom comes by grace of God, and all that comes not by his grace must fail. For men in earnest have no time to waste in patching fig leaves for the naked truth. I will have one more grapple with the man Charles Stuart, whom the boy came, the man stands not in awe of. I, perchance, am one raised up by the almighty arm to witness some great truth to all the world, souls destined to o'erleap the vulgar lot and mould the world unto the scheme of god have a foreconsciousness of their high doom as men are known to shiver at the heart when the cold shadow of some coming ill creeps slowly o'er their spirits unawares hath good less power of prophecy than ill how else could men whom god hath called to sway earth's rudder and to steer the bark of truth beating against the tempest toward their port, 
bear all the mean and buzzing grievances, the petty martyrdoms wherein sin strives to weary out the tethered hope of faith, the sneers, the unrecognizing look of friends who worship the dead corpse of old king custom, where it doth lie in state within the church, striving to cover up the mighty ocean with a man's palm, and making even the truth lie for them, holding up the glass reversed to make the hope of man seem farther off. My God, when I read o'er the bitter lives of men whose eager hearts were quite too great to beat beneath the crampid mode of the day, and see them mocked at by the world they love, haggling with prejudice for pennyworths of that reform which their hard toil will make the common birthright of the age to come, when I see this, spite of my faith in God, I marvel how their hearts bear up so long. Nor could they, but for this same prophecy, this inward feeling of the glorious end. Deem me not fond, but in my warmer youth, ere my heart's bloom was soiled and brushed away, I had great dreams of mighty things to come, of conquest, whether by the sword or pen, I knew not, but some conquest I would have, or else swift death. Now wiser grown in years, I find youth's dreams are but the flutterings of those strong wings, whereon the soul shall soar in after time to win a starry throne, and so I cherish them, for they were lots which I, a boy, cast in the helm of fate. Nor will I draw them, since a man's right hand, a right hand guided by an earnest soul with a true instinct, takes the golden prize from out a thousand blanks. What men call luck is the prerogative of valiant souls. The fealty life pays its rightful kings. The helm is shaking now, and I will stay to pluck my lot forth, it were sin to flee. So they two turned together, one to die, fighting for freedom on the bloody field, the other far more happy to become a name earth wears forever next to her heart, one of the few that have a right to rank with the true makers, for his spirit wrought order from chaos, proved that right divine dwelt only in the excellence of truth and far within old darkness hostile lines advanced and pitched the shining tents of light. Nor shall the grateful muse forget to tell that, not the least among his many claims to deathless honor, he was Milton's friend, a man not second among those who lived to show us that the poet's lyre demands an arm of tougher sinew than the sword. End of A Glance Behind the Curtain by James Russell Lowell The Harlot's House by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Jerry Lefebvre We caught the tread of dancing feet, We loitered down the moonlit street, And stopped beneath the harlot's house. Inside, above the din and fray, We heard the loud musicians play The truest libes hers of Strauss. Like strange mechanical grotesques making fantastic arabesques, the shadows raced across the blind. We watched the ghostly dancers spin to sound of horn and violin like black leaves wheeling in the wind. Like wire-pulled automatons, slim silhouetted skeletons went sliding through the slow quadrille. They took each other by the hand and danced a stately saraband, their laughter echoed thin and shrill. Sometimes a clockwork puppet pressed a phantom lover to her breast, sometimes they seemed to try to sing. Sometimes a horrible marionette came out and smoked its cigarette upon the steps like a live thing. Then turning to my love I said, The dead are dancing with the dead, the dust is whirling with the dust. But she, she heard the violin, and left my side and entered in, love passed into the house of lust. Then suddenly the tune went false, the shadows wearied of the waltz, the shadows ceased to wheel and whirl. And down the long and silent street, the dawn with silver sandaled feet crept like a frightened girl. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Hope by Anonymous. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Hope for the mirror. 
he marked two sunbeams upward driven till they blend in one in the bosom of heaven and when closed over the eyelid of night his own mind's eye saw it doubly bright and as upward and upward it floated on he deemed it a seraph and anon through its light on heaven's floor he made the shadow bright of his dead love's shade in her living beauty and he wrapped her in light which dropped from the eye of the infinite and as she breathed her heavenward sigh twas halved by that light all radiantly as it lit her up to eternity then the future opened its occult scroll and his own inward man was refined to soul and straightway it rose to the realms above on the wings of thought till it joined his love and though from that beauteous trance he woke still lingered the thought and he called it hope end of poem this recording is in the public domain Hymn to Intellectual Beauty by Percy Bysshe Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tomlinson London, 2017 The awful shadow of some unseen power floats through unseen among us, visiting this various world with as inconstant wing as summer winds that creep from flower to flower like moonbeams that behind some piney mountain shower it visits with inconsistent glance each human heart and countenance like hues and harmonies of evening like clouds in starlight widely spread like memory of music fled like aught that for its grace may be dear and yet dearer for its mystery spirit of beauty thou dost consecrate with thine own hues all thou dost shine upon of human thought or form where art thou gone why dost thou pass away and leave our state this dim vast veil of tears vacant and desolate Ask why the sunlight not for ever weaves rainbows o'er yon mountain river, why aught should fail and fade that once is shown, why fear and dream and death and birth cast on the daylight of this earth such gloom, why man has such a scope for love and hate, despondency and hope. No voice from some sublimer world hath ever to sage or poet these responses given therefore the names of demon ghost and heaven remain the records of their vain endeavour frail spells whose utter charm might not avail to sever from all we hear and all we see doubt chance and mutability thy light alone like mist o'er the mountains driven or music by the night wind sent through strings of some still instrument or moonlight on a midnight stream gives grace and truth to life's unquiet dream love hope and self-esteem like clouds depart and come for some uncertain moments lent man were immortal and omnipotent didst thou unknown and awful as thou art keep with thy glorious train firm state within his heart thou messenger of sympathies that wax and wane in lovers' eyes, thou, that to human thought art nourishment, like darkness to a dying flame. Depart not as thy shadow came, depart not, lest the grave should be, like life and fear, a dark reality. While yet a boy I sought for ghosts and sped through many a listening chamber, cave and ruin and starlight wood with fearful steps pursuing hopes of high talk with the departed dead i called on poisonous names with which our youth is fed i was not heard i saw them not when musing deeply on the lot of life at that sweet time when winds are wooing all vital things that wake to bring news of birds and blossoming sudden 
thy shadow fell on me i shrieked and clasped my hands in ecstasy i vowed that i would dedicate my powers to thee and thine have i not kept the vow with beating heart and streaming eyes even now i call the phantoms of a thousand hours each from his voiceless grave they have envisioned bowers of studious zeal or love's delight outwatch with me the envious night they know that never joy illume my brow unlinked with hope that thou wouldst free this world from its dark slavery that thou o awful loveliness wouldst give whate'er these words cannot express the day becomes more solemn and serene when noon is past there is a harmony in autumn and a lustre in its sky which through the summer is not heard or seen and if it could not be as if it had not been thus let thy power which like the truth of nature on my passive youth descended to my onward life supply its calm to one who worships thee and every form containing thee whom spirit fair thy spells did bind to fear himself and love all humankind End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Inclusions by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Oh, wilt thou have my hand, dear, to lie along in thine? As a little stone in a running stream, it seems to lie and pine now drop the poor pale hand dear unfit to plight with thine oh wilt thou have my cheek dear drawn closer to thine own my cheek is white my cheek is worn by many a tear run down now leave a little space dear lest it should wet thine own oh must thou have my soul dear commingled with thy soul red grows the cheek and warm the hand the part is in the whole nor hands nor cheeks keep separate when soul is joined to soul end of poem this recording is in the public domain Insufficiency by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. There is no one beside thee, and no one above thee. Thou standest alone as the nightingale sings, and my words that would praise thee are impotent things, for none can express thee, though all should approve thee. I love thee so, dear, that I only can love thee say what can i do for thee weary thee grieve thee lean on thy shoulder new burdens to add weep my tears over thee making thee sad oh hold me not love me not let me retrieve thee i love thee so dear that i only can leave thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Lights of Cobb and Co. by Henry Lawson. Read for LibriVox.org by Son of the Exiles. The Lights of Cobb and Co. Fire lighted on the table, a meal for sleepy men, a lantern in the stable, a jingle now and then, the mail coach looming darkly by light of moon and star, the growl of sleepy voices a candle in the bar a stumble in the passage of folk with wits abroad a swear word from a bedroom the shout of all aboard get up hold fast there and down the range we go five hundred miles of scattered camps will watch for cobb and co old coaching towns already decaying for their sins uncounted halfway houses 
and scores of ten-mile inns the riders from the stations by lonely granite peaks the black boy for the shepherds on sheep and cattle creeks the roaring camps of gulgong and many a digger's rest the diggers on the lachlan the huts of farthest west some twenty thousand exiles who sailed for weal or woe the bravest hearts of twenty lands will wait for cobb and co the morning star has vanished the frost and fog are gone in one of those grand mornings which but on mountains dawn a flask of friendly whisky each other's hopes we share and throw our topcoats open to drink the mountain air the roads are rare to travel and life seems all complete the grind of wheels on gravel the trot of horses feet the trot 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 and canter as down the spur we go the green sweeps to horizons blue that call for cobb and co we take a bright girl actress through western dust and damps to bear the home world message and sing for sinful camps to wake the hearts and break them wild hearts that hope and ache ah when she thinks of those days her own must nearly break five miles this side the goldfield a loud triumphant shout five hundred cheering diggers have snatched the horses out with old lang syne in chorus through roaring camps they go the cheer for her and cheer for home and cheer for cobb and co three lamps above the ridges and gorges dark and deep a flash on sandstone cuttings where sheer the sidings sweep a flash on shrouded wagons on water ghastly white weird bush and scattered remnants of rushes in the night across the swollen river a flash beyond the ford ride hard to warn the driver he's drunk or mad good lord but on the bank to westward a broad triumphant glow a hundred miles shall see to-night the lights of cobb and co swift scramble up the siding where teams climb inch by inch pause bird-like on the summit then breakneck down the pinch past haunted halfway houses where convicts made the bricks scrub yards and new bark shanties we dash with five and six by clear ridge country rivers and gaps where tracks run high where waits the lonely horseman cut clear against the sky through stringy barks and blue gum and box and pine we go new camps are stretching cross the plains the roots of cobb and co throw down the reins old driver there's no one left to shout the ruined in survivor must take the horses out a poor old coach hereafter we're lost to all such things no bursts of song or laughter shall shake your leathern springs when creeping in unnoticed by railway sidings drear or left in yards for lumber decaying with the year oh who'll think how in those days when distant fields were broad you raced across the lachlan side with twenty-five on board not all the ships that sail away since roaring days are done not all the boats that steam from port nor all the trains that run shall take such hopes and loyal hearts for men shall never know such days as when the royal mail was run by cobb and co the greyhounds race across the sea the special cleaves the haze but these seem dull and slow to me compared with roaring days the eyes that watched are dim with age and souls are weak and slow the hearts are dust or hardened now that broke for cobb and co end of poem this recording is in the public domain Lilies in the Fire by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. One. Ah, you stack of white lilies, all white and gold. I am adrift as a sunbeam, and without form or having, 
save i light on you to warm your pallor into radiance flush your cold white beauty into incandescence you are not a stack of white lilies tonight but a white and clustered star transfigured by me tonight and lighting these ruddy leaves like a star dropped through the slender bare arms of the branches your tired maidens who lift swart arms to fend me off but i come like a wind of fire upon you like to some stray white beam who on you his fire unladens and you are a glistening toadstool shining here among the crumpled beech leaves phosphorescent my stack of white lilies burning incandescent of me a soft white star among the leaves my dear two is it with pain my dear that you shudder so is it because i have hurt you with pain my dear did i shiver nay truly i did not know a dewdrop may be splashed on my face down here why even now you speak through close shut teeth i have been too much for you ah i remember the ground is a little chilly underneath the leaves and dear you consume me all to an ember you hold yourself all hard as if my kisses hurt as i gave them you put me away ah never i put you away yet each kiss hisses hot as a drop of fire wastes me away three i am ashamed you wanted me not to-night nay it is always so you sigh with me your radiance dims when i draw too near and my free fire enters your petals like death you wilt dead white ah i do know and i am deep ashamed you love me while i hover tenderly like clinging sunbeams kissing you but see when i close and fire upon you and you are flamed with the swiftest fire of my love you are destroyed tis a degradation deep to me that my best soul's whitest lightning which should bright attest god stepping down to earth in one white stride means only to you a clogged numb burden of flesh heavy to bear even heavy to uprear again from earth like lilies wilted and sere flagged on the floor that before stood up so fresh end of poem this recording is in the public domain the love song of j alfred proofrock by t s eliot read for librivox dot org by daphne ma let us go then you and i when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table let us go through certain half deserted streets the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-eyed cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster cells streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question oh do not ask what is it let us go and make our visit in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo the yellow fog that drops its back upon the window panes the yellow smoke that drops its muzzle on the window panes licked its tongue into the corners of the evening linger upon the pools that stand in drains let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys slipped by the terrace made a sudden leap and seeing that it was a soft october night curled once about the house and fell asleep and indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street rubbing its back upon the window panes there will be time there will be time to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet there will be time to murder and create and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of the toast and tea in the room the women come and go talking of michelangelo and indeed there will be time to wonder do i dare and do i dare time to turn back and descend the stair 
the bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all. Have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. But how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all. The eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase, and when I'm formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the bad ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap around a soul. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone a task through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged clothes Scartling along the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening sleeps so peacefully, Smoothed by long fingers, I sleep, tired, or it malingers, Stretched on the floor here beside you and me. So I, after tea and cakes and ices, Have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and faced it, wept and prayed, Though I have seen my head, grown slightly bold, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and sneaker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, I'm on the porcelain, I'm on some talk of you and me. Would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all, would it have been worth while, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worth while if one sat in a pillow or throwing off a soul and turning toward the window should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. No, I'm not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord. One that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool. Deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old, I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. 
I have heard the mermaid sing in it to each. I don't think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreath with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us and we drown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch, whose flame is the imprisoned lightning, and her name Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep, ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp, Beside the golden door. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Night of Man by George Sterling. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Gachuk. Europe, how have kings dealt with thee? and sown thine every acre from a human breast red was the seed and red the harrow pressed to bitter fields whose harvest was a moan and the long years pass on to the unknown and cannon utter now thy lord's unrest where still their armies gather for the test and heavy darkness holds about the throne and shall they sow forever in this wise to reap that corn whose roots take hold on hell better a desert and the sunlight there in which the lions gaze with stony eyes from nameless ruins where the lizards dwell and the small hawk floats lonely on the air End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Now Sleeps the Crimson Petal by Alfred Tennyson. Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist. Now sleeps the crimson petal, now the white. Nor waves the cypress in the palace walk. Nor winks the gold fin in the porphyry font. The firefly wakens, waken thou with me. Now droops the milk-white peacock like a ghost, And like a ghost she glimmers on to me. Now lies the earth all Danae to the stars, And all thy heart lies open unto me. Now slides the silent meteor on, and leaves a shining furrow as thy thoughts in me. Now folds the lily all her sweetness up and slips into the bosom of the lake. So fold thyself, my dearest, thou, and slip into my bosom and be lost in me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode, Intimations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood by William Wordsworth 
read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. There was a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth, and every common sight, to me did seem apparelled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. It is not now as it hath been of yore. Turn wheresoe'er I may, by night or day, the things which I have seen I now can see no more. The rainbow comes and goes, and lovely is the rose. The moon doth with delight look round her when the heavens are bare. Waters on a starry night are beautiful and fair. The sunshine is a glorious birth, but yet I know, where'er I go, that there hath passed away a glory from the earth. Now, while the birds thus sing a joyous song, and while the young lambs bound, as to the tabor's sound, to me alone there came a thought of grief. A timely utterance gave that thought relief, and I again am strong. The cataracts blow their trumpets from the steep. No more shall grief of mine the season wrong. I hear the echoes through the mountains throng. The winds come to me from the fields of sleep, and all the earth is gay. Land and sea give themselves up to jollity, and with the heart of May doth every beast keep holiday. Thou child of joy, shout round me, let me hear thy shouts, thou happy shepherd boy. Ye blessed creatures, I have heard the call ye to each other make. I see the heavens laugh with you in your jubilee. My heart is at your festival, my head hath its coronal. The fullness of your bliss I feel, I feel it all. O oh, evil day, if I were sullen, while earth herself is adorning this sweet May morning, and the children are culling on every side, in a thousand valleys far and wide, fresh flowers, while the sun shines warm, and the babe leaps up on his mother's arm i hear i hear with joy i hear but there's a tree of many one a single field which i have looked upon both of them speak of something that is gone the pansy at my feet doth the same tale repeat whither is fled the visionary gleam where is it now the glory and the dream our birth is but a sleep and a forgetting the soul that rises with us, our life's star, hath had elsewhere its setting, and cometh from afar. Not in entire forgetfulness, and not in utter nakedness, but trailing clouds of glory do we come from God who is our home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. Shades of the prison-house begin to close upon the growing boy, but he beholds the light, and whence it flows, he sees it in his joy. The youth, who daily farther from the east must travel, still is nature's priest, and by the vision splendid is on his way attended. At length the man perceives it die away, and fade into the light of common day. Earth fills her lap with pleasures of her own, yearnings she hath in her own natural kind, and even with something of a mother's mind, and no unworthy aim, the homely nurse doth all she can to make her foster-child, her inmate, man. Forget the glories he hath known, and that imperial palace whence he came. Behold the child among his newborn blisses, a six years darling of a pygmy size. See where mid work of his own hand he lies, fretted by sallies of his mother's kisses, with light upon him from his father's eyes. See at his feet some little plan or chart, some fragment from his dream of human life, shaped by himself with newly learned art a wedding or a festival a mourning or a funeral and this hath now his heart and unto this he frames his song then will he fit his tongue to dialogues of business love or strife but it will not be long ere this be thrown aside and with new joy and pride the little actor cons another part filling from time to time his humorous stage with all the persons down to palsied age that life brings with her in her equipage as if his whole vocation were endless imitation. Thou, whose exterior semblance doth belie thy soul's immensity, thou best philosopher, who yet dost keep thy heritage, thou eye among the blind, that, deaf and silent, readst the eternal deep, haunted forever by the eternal mind. Mighty prophet, seer blessed, on whom those truths do rest which we are toiling all our lives to find in darkness lost the darkness of the grave thou over whom thy immortality broods like the day a master or a slave a presence which is not to be put by to whom the grave is but a lonely bed without the sense or sight of day or the warm light a place of thought 
where we in waiting lie thou little child yet glorious in the might of heaven-born freedom on thy being's height why with such earnest pains dost thou provoke the years to bring the inevitable yoke thus blindly with thy blessedness at strife full soon thy soul shall have her earthly freight and custom lie upon thee with a weight heavy as frost and deep almost as life o oh, joy that in our embers is something that doth live that nature yet remembers what was so fugitive the thought of our past years in me doth breed perpetual benediction not indeed for that which is most worthy to be blessed delight and liberty the simple creed of childhood whether busy or at rest with new-fledged hope still fluttering in his breast not for these i raise the song of thanks and praise but for those obstinate questionings of sense and outward things fallings from us vanishings blank misgivings of a creature moving about in worlds not realized high instincts before which our mortal nature did tremble like a guilty thing surprised but for those first affections those shadowy recollections which be they what they may are yet the fountain light of all our day are yet a master light of all our seeing uphold us cherish and have power to make our noisy years seem moments in the being of the eternal silence truths that wake to perish never which neither listlessness nor mad endeavour nor man nor boy nor all that is at enmity with joy can utterly abolish or destroy hence in a season of calm weather though inland far we be our souls have sight of that immortal sea which brought us hither can in a moment travel thither and see the children sport upon the shore and hear the mighty waters rolling evermore then sing ye birds sing sing a joyous song and let the young lambs bound as to the tabor's sound we in thought will join your throng ye that pipe and ye that play ye that through your hearts to-day feel the gladness of the may what though the radiance which was once so bright be now for ever taken from my sight though nothing can bring back the hour of splendour in the grass of glory in the flower we will grieve not rather find strength in what remains behind in the primal sympathy which having been must ever be in the soothing thoughts that spring out of human suffering in the faith that looks through death in years that bring the philosophic mind and o ye fountains meadows hills and groves forebode not any severing of our loves yet in my heart of hearts i feel your might i only have relinquished one delight to live beneath your more habitual sway i love the brooks which down their channels fret even more than when i tripped lightly as they the innocent brightness of a new-born day is lovely yet the clouds that gather round the setting sun do take a sober colouring from an eye that hath kept watch o'er man's mortality another race hath been and other palms are won thanks to the human heart by which we live thanks to its tenderness its joys and fears to me the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On Moonlit Heath and Lonesome Bank by A. E. Houseman Read for LibriVox.org by Brian Murphy On moonlit heath and lonesome bank The sheep beside me graze, And yon the gallows used to clank Fast by the four crossways a careless shepherd once would keep the flocks by moonlight there and high amongst the glimmering sheep the dead man stood on air they hang us now in shrewsbury jail the whistles blow forlorn and trains all night groan on the rail to men that die at morn there sleeps in shrewsbury jail to-night or wakes as may betide a better lad if things went right than most that sleep outside and naked to the hangman's noose the morning clocks will ring a neck god made for other use than strangling in a string and sharp the link of life will snap and dead on air will stand heels that held up as straight a chap as treads upon the land so here i'll watch the night and wait to see the morning shine when he will hear the stroke of eight and not the stroke of nine and wish my friend as sound asleep as lads I did not know that shepherded the moonlit sheep a hundred years ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Second Coming by W. B. Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the censor cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs, while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To the Allied Arms by George Sterling. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. Where children slept, gun answers unto gun. Where peace was on the orchards, armies fight. Now burst on vale and devastated height The tides that raven and the seas that stun. Yet wage ye now the battles of the sun, And with a holy ray your flags are bright, Though deep on Europe lies the twofold night Of pain's despair and death's oblivion more clear more terrible the days reveal what foe is yours and how malignly vast the horror and betrayal of its plan that tyranny which rears its crest of steel to blot the future's blue a shadow cast by hell's red star on liberty and man End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Tiger by William Blake. Read for LibriVox.org by Scotty Smith. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye? could frame thy fearful symmetry in what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes on what wings dare he aspire what the hand dare seize the fire and what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart and when thy heart began to beat what dread hand and what dread feet what the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain, what the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wedding Morn by D. H. Lawrence. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The morning breaks like a pomegranate in a shining crack of red. Ah, 
when tomorrow the dawn comes late whitening across the bed and will find me watching at the marriage gate and waiting while light is shed on him who is sleeping satiate with a sunk abandoned head and when the dawn comes creeping in cautiously i shall raise myself to watch the morning win my first of days as it shows him sleeping a sleep he got of me is under my gaze he grows distinct and i see his hot face freed of the wavering blaze then i shall know which image of god my man is made toward and i shall know my bitter rod or my rich reward and i shall know the stamp and worth of the coin i've accepted as mine shall see an image of heaven or of earth on his minted metal shine yea and i long to see him sleep in my power utterly i long to know what i have to keep i long to see my love that spinning coin laid still and plain at the side of me for me to count for i know he will greatly enrich in me and then he will be mine he will lie in my power utterly opening his value plain to my eye he will sleep of me he will lie negligent resign his all to me and i shall watch the dawn light up for me the sleeping wealth of mine and i shall watch the wan light shine on a sleep that is filled of me on his brow where the wisps of fond hair twine so truthfully on his lips where the light breaths come and go naive and winsomely on his limbs that i shall weep to know lie under my mastery end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Wild Swans at Cool by William Butler Yeats. Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp. The trees are in their autumn beauty, the woodland paths are dry. Under the October twilight, the water mirrors a still sky. Upon the brimming water among the stones are nine and fifty swans. The nineteenth autumn has come upon me since I first made my count. I saw, before I had well finished, all suddenly mount and scatter wheeling in great broken rings upon their clamorous wings. I have looked upon these brilliant creatures, and now my heart is sore. All's changed since I, hearing at twilight the first time on this shore the bell beat of their wings above my head, trod with a lighter tread unwearied still lover by lover they paddle in the cold companionable streams or climb the air their hearts have not grown old passion or conquest wander where they will attend upon them still but now they drift on the still water mysterious beautiful among what rushes will they build by what lake's edge or pool delight men's eyes, when I awake some day, to find they have flown away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.